Okay. So Tudor handwriting is both beautiful and fascinating. And the more we learn, the more we appreciate the scribes who painstakingly produced all of these documents that people love so well. And it's really a debt to human hands. In fact, when I say that, I almost feel praying um, and hearts and minds. But so much of it is experimentation and trial and error. And it, it brought us to this point. So here I go to early modern Brit Britain. Um, and this is my favorite bullet point of the whole <laughs> um, presentation. The monarchy started Henry VII consolidating power over the feudal system. Now that's like a little innocent bullet point, but 90% of the people lived on farms. 90% were rural, and this was the start of the change to the city. That was massive upheaval. Then when they come to the cities, it's frustrating, um, disease, um, lots of turmoil, um, and it was a gigantic shift. They're losing their lands to public domain. And I um, was impressed with actually the tutors administrative sense and um, their ability, of course, lots of it is through tax collection, but to, uh, uh, you know, start, you know, having that vision for what the society could be. So that to me is like major. Then I have always heard about France being, you know, kind of like a, a thing and, and they only had the fifth of the population. And I was just like, that is so interesting because France was huge. And then education for the people was haphazard and short. The Reformation mentality was starting to take hold and the commercial class started to rise. Now, when that happens, people are gonna need more things, entertainment too, um, but they're gonna be more educated and in those urban areas. So this was like majorly exciting um, from a distance, especially, uh, you know, it must've been hard to be there. Um, so Scribner's, um, or professional scribes or copyists, as they were called, were often students, which I thought was very interesting too, because they needed a way to get through um, their lives as well. Um, and also to, um, um, I like to mention only 25% knew how to write their names, but they have been analyzing that and I will circle back and address that later. Okay, so what I'll be talking about is there was like a heritage of book hands and then document hands. And um, again, in the, in, it's very interesting in the research, they're like, this is only a book hand. Oh, wait a minute, it was a document. Like, it depends on who you're reading. And it is just, it's like a kind of a moving target all the time. So you have to read a lot of people to kind of really see what they're talking about. But um, manuscripts were so mature and beloved and the, um, illustrations were lavish. So that was like a fully mature scribal culture. And then, you know, as we needed more deeds and contracts and various things for people, they had to develop out of that. So most things happen out of necessity. So where our story begins is with the hand called Anglicana. And this was unique to England, which I find interesting because everything else is like kind of crazy and uh, overlapping. You know, because like, all you need is like one person to visit with a friend who has a copy book and, and like <laughs> the right person grabs it and then you have a whole nother tangent. It's, it's fascinating. And that's really how it works, actually. But Anglicana was like um, the start of their needing to go a little bit faster. Um, they shortened the ascenders and the descenders. It was still very upright. So you could tell the pace of life is slower. You can tell right there. Um, and it was written for Latin. So, you know, again, it's a different class of people, you know, using it. Not everyone can read Latin, um, but we're just starting to get a little, little bit of speed. So they don't, they're not 100% sure if it came from France or England or maybe a mixture, but then Gothic cursive secretary was introduced and that's when everything took off. In fact, books became more affordable because they could be reproduced faster. And again, it went into the mainstream. So you've heard of court hand, correct? That is what Anglicana actually is. And then secretary kind of started being the hybrid and we're working our way towards italic. 
Okay, but what fascinates me about secretary is it was still both spiky and loopy. And I'm like, as a writer, I'm like, wow, I mean, how could they go fast and keep the spikes, which I love, and then the loopiness, which is so expressive. And I'm just like, this is this is amazing. I always loved it and wanted to look into it. Okay, so I want to do a little survey and show you some of the range. I'm not going to show you a million things, um, but I'm, I'm sure you see them all the time in your in your reference. So, but I look at this, I just love it so. Me and I like the crashing. I like the crashing between the lines because the person writing this is so confident. They're, like they're so confident, you can read it, and this is it, and. That, that has a lot to do with kind of how you take it in. But to me, it looks like a bird running across a piece of vellum. And what is a quill? A bird. Yeah. And I was just like, I, um, anyway, it just, it just gives me shivers. And you know what? This is just from one little like, you know, parish, you know, something out in the boondock. I mean, and, and we're looking at it like oh my gosh so i'm just like i wonder what they considered a good letter form i wonder how they looked at it because we are looking at this with totally modern eyes totally modern that's why i mean it i what i like about this project too you have to slow down and question everything and that's wonderful now this is an inventory of henry the eighth's estate when he died and you can see they brought in like one of their you know very controlled people and to me this is also beautiful because you get more of the thick and thins, which I love. Um, it, it doesn't have to crash. It's just so, like, again, so personal. Um, and it's very clear. A lot of that has to do with interline spacing. This is, again, this one is really idiosyncratic. And I find it interesting because in that body of the paragraph there, it's kind of crazy, but it's consistently crazy. And that is the key to calligraphy. I think that was the hardest thing for me to learn as a student is that the letter forms didn't have to be perfect. I'm like, why not? You know? <laughs> Isn't that the whole goal? They're like, no, but as long as you're consistent with your imperfections. And I'm like, <laughs> that took a while to wrap my head around. But if you look at this, the spaces between the words are like sometimes gigantic. But even though it's like random, it's kind of, always random. So again, this is like why I love pattern. And when I worked at American Greetings, I also did wrapping paper, which is fantastic because uh, I, I like paragraphs versus headlines, but I, I've done them both. But um, there's something about the pattern that it forms that I find fascinating. And we will, we will come back to this little document later. This is a page from uh, a piece called The Marriage Contract Between Wit and Wisdom. I, I believe it was um, like a comedy of manners and it was uh, important culturally. And I just wanted to you to see something different that was like truly just dashed off. <laughs> and this is a typical, very typical uh, scribal secretary hand. And to me, that is, is just absolutely gorgeous. It just, now, but when you look at it, not a lot of contrast between the thick and thins, but what it's doing, it's still got the upper, it, it's just different. And, and every time you look at something, you're like, the individual is so important. This is my last in this batch, and it is in the later Elizabethan period. And um, it's, it's more about the idiosyncratic um, caps and very thin, but it's just so elegant. I just, I just had to show it to you because it's like, takes it to the far end of maturity. Now, this is our exemplar from a, a copy book called Arigi's Operina. And it was very early on and it tried to, you know, control it and show, you know, uh, an alphabet with optional letters. It's is very important. The fact that they could engrave or print these things by carving them backwards for the, pre I mean, to me, that is also amazing. And, and I don't know where these people, I guess they, they had done seals and stuff like that, where that's where the skill set came from. But I mean, my gosh. <laughs> so secretary is more angular 
than ang and italicized than Anglicana it's because they did angle the nib of the um, quill. Um, and that's part of the secret. I still would love to go back and see someone writing it fast, but um, so it retains the spikiness and loopiness and more joined letters and ligatures. And I don't know if you know this, but there was only 24 letters in the alphabet because I and J and U and V were interchangeable. So you gotta be kind of careful. That said, there were other types of uh, characters like Thorn, which was uh, the Y that looking, that represented TH. So when you see ye old in, uh, it's really a TH. Um, and then yo, which is the GH, and then the long S, which once you get used to that, you can get over that pretty quick. It's really interesting. It's just like an F with no crossbar. And ampersands, of course, are so expressive and wonderful. Um, <clears throat> and you just wonder if that's where they used uh, to express themselves and really you know, show off a little bit with the ampersands to make it more personal. And then, of course, I threw in the pound sterling because as you're reading documents, you got it, you know, not everything is what you might think. It's really, it's really kind of fun if you have time. <laughs> so the public now is growing more literate and they did jump from um, Latin to English because more people needed to write and understand. So again, Anglicana was for Latin. So secretary was perfect for English, but it was also used for Welsh and um, German. <laughs> 